Welcome back, everyone. Last time, we had gone over some brief history on DRG and had gone over the interviews of the four crew members. With that covered, it's time for us to move on to the planet itself, specifically its inhabitants, be it natives or foreign invaders, from robots to sentient Morkite to plague hearts. We will be covering all of the horrors that are brave 3.5 crew members looking at you scout face on a job to job basis oh and don't forget bosco the lovable company robot so as a quick note here the planet has been divided into regions and hazard levels along with mission types on a more job oriented basis depending on hazard level and environment there may be different enemy types we have regions varying from radiation hellscapes to magma paradises there are also special instances in some parts of Hoxies, instances of things such as insane amounts of gold, low gravity, and EMP for shields. There are also occasional anomalous enemies such as enemies made out of pure gold and loot bugs full of an entire mine's worth of gold. There is also a hermit crab that conceivably either grows crystals out of him or just jams them into his shell. We currently do not know which it is. Now, we do not know a whole lot about everything, and that is mainly because most of the operations taking place on Hoxies involve more resource stealing rather than researching. We will be starting with Glyphus, the guardians of Hoxies who kill anything that dare step foot onto their planet. They come in a large variation of shapes and sizes, and Evolution seems to have designed them to each fit certain roles. Most of them are melee oriented, with different small changes and abilities among them, alongside some of the ranged Glyphus. We'll be skipping over the generic variations of Glyphids, and we'll be covering mainly the baseline variants primarily, as well as any unique variants that stand out. Starting out with the run to the litter, we have the spawn and swarmer variants of Glyphids. Both of these do microscopic amounts of damage and have tiny amounts of health, usually dying in one or two bullets. Two being very generous, of course, but spawning in groups of 20 or more. If you die to these things, there is one key strategy you need to do. That is, of course, stop playing the game. Turn off whatever you're using, refund the game if you can, because you do not belong here. Their base speed makes them very easy to, easy to avoid. This is because swarmers only spawn from holes in the walls, and spawn are only created by brood nexus that should be easy to find around the map. Moving on from the baby's playpen, we have the still generic but adult Glyphids. The Grunt, and its variants, are the lifeline of the Glyphid forces. The changes from the normal Glyphids that we have are as such. One explodes using volatile bladders. One has gained hardened frontal claws for extra damage. There are two spitter types, two that shoot acid, and one that shoots webs. And we have one that somehow crossbred with what looks like to be a scorpion that tries to gore you with its horns even have one that can camouflage itself to be nearly invisible while it sneaks up on you to attack. The last of these variants is one that nearly exclusively lives in the walls or ceilings. It will periodically pop out for a few seconds, shoot at you, and then disappear. Moving on from the white toast, have an ass suburban neighborhood bugs with good credit scores, we have the big cheese of the Glyphids, the trio of distraction soaking up massive amounts of bullets and wasting as much time as dwarfishly possible. We got the Praetorian, the Warden, and the Oppressor. The Praetorian being the baseline unit in this crew, and the Oppressor being the upgraded version. The Praetorian has nearly unbreakable armor, meanwhile the Oppressor has literally unbreakable armor. This forces you to either use weapons with status effects, or try to flank them in their weak spot. Though, of course, they are never alone. Now, when it comes to the Warden, it uses a very interesting tactic of defense. Having a good amount of health and minor amounts of armor, it decides to buff everyone around it, making them a much larger threat. The Warden buffs both damage resistance and damage output to achieve this and can do it to most Glyphids around him. Now onto the true defenders of Hoxies. Usually, these do not spawn by themselves, and they typically have to be hatched or broken out of their eggs. They will wreak bloody vengeance when awoken, the standard dreadnought being nearly twice as big as an oppressor and dealing nearly double the damage of an oppressor as well. 
has certain moves such as seismic slams that have the potential to kill entire teams of dwarves and can shoot balls of fire out of its mouth. On the highest difficulty in the game, it will instantly kill dwarves. The dreadnoughts also all boast regeneration at certain stages when damaged, able to nearly instantly heal back armor. There are also two special types of dreadnought outside of the original, these being the gay lovers, aka the twins, and the hive guard. Twins boast the interesting gimmick of being born in the same egg, making them smaller than your typical dreadnought. On top of that, however, they counteract this by healing each other when either of them are injured. This makes it so you have to typically kill both nearly at the same time. One is a ranged combatant, while the other is melee. The Arbalist boasts two ranged attacks, this being raining down a shower of fire, and the other attack being a spread shot of five fireballs. On the other hand, the Lacerator is 50% faster than his twin and has breakable armor. However, the last raider is technically harder to kill thanks to the fact that it will always be pursuing you. Let's not forget about the Hive Guard, the final dreadnought in the trio of dreadnought types. This one is essentially an upgraded version of the Warden. Completely unable to take damage unless the summoned troops are all dead around him. He basically traded a good amount of his damage for drowning dwarves in enemy bodies, spawning nearly any type of glyphid. And now we move on to the secret final boss of the glyphids, the detonator. This thing is known to either instantly kill everyone or be quickly dispatched in a panic of bullets. This is a massive glyphid covered in large amounts of volatile fluids. The detonator will trigger when near a target, causing devastating damage and leaving a gigantic crater in its wake. Also, if you do not pop the large sacks on its back, the explosion will be even bigger when it inevitably detonates, making it even more deadly. Oh, and don't worry, there is also an elite version, the bulk detonator. Bigger explosion, bigger damage. Now, as an honorable mention of a horrible mutation of the Glyphids, we also have the Stingtail. It has somehow evolved to grow tusks and a scorpion tail. They are not wildly dangerous, though they are very fast while charging. You will find that typically the worst thing about these creatures is having to look at them. And now onto the other species that inhabit Hoxies. We have the Shellback and the Nyaka Trawler. Two extremely different species, but both serving nearly identical purposes. That being digging or rolling as fast as possible before colliding into the groin of any unsuspecting dwarves that are invading their territory. Their tactics usually involve trying to catch the dwarves off guard before running away and trying to repeat the process later. The shellback slightly breaks this process by also having a massively damaging spit attack, although it still prefers to roll around most of the time. We are now about to move on to the spawning and stationary creatures of Hoxus, but before we do, we have one more creature to cover. A creature beyond our dimension, and looking like an ape crawling on all fours. These creatures are summoned by the Core Stones in order to defend it. They are not the most daunting of foes, but should still be mentioned. Anyways, on to the stationaries. We can start with the Glyphid Brood Nexus, home of the Glyphid spawners. The Brood Nexus is a large fleshy construct that seems to somehow be able to replicate the DNA of other species and use their designs for its own protection. Even upon death, the Nexus will shoot out large amounts of Glyphid spawns. Other than that though, it has pretty decent health and no attack of its own. Its eyes are its main weak points. Hey, shithead! You wanna get shit-faced? Well, we got the brew for you! Here at Abyss Brewery, introducing Blackout Stout, the ultimate dwarven brew for the ultimate dwarven experience. Here we have a drink that will turn your chest hair and pubic hair into a forest of manliness with one sip. This alcohol is 2,000% proof. If you can see the bottom of the cup, you can be rest assured that you'll be seeing God next. Buy Blackout Stout at your local Abyss Bar today, as supplies will not last, as the liberals at the FDA have complained about certain ingredients. 
Warning. Blackouts now can cause blindness, amnesia, explosive diarrhea, heartburn, sudden loss of emotion, herpes, hepatitis A, B, and C, loss of hearing, loss of balance, extreme need to buy more blackouts out, and a 2,956% chance of domestic violence. As if Hoxies couldn't get any worse, one of the worst creatures imaginable has to be on the planet as well. Wasps. They are just like normal, that means extremely territorial and protecting their nests. Their nests are very easy to kill, it's just that dealing with the consequences that come afterwards is the hard part. On a side note, all of the interior pieces of the hive are blood red for some reason, which is very odd. Now, moving on from that abomination, I believe it's time we cover the plant section of these stationary creatures. Let's start with the tyrant weeds. These are a near-sentient amalgamation of plants that have a goal to spread as far as possible. It has a series of sprouts that continuously spawn and shoot acid at dwarves, as well as a healing pod to further prolong the fight and try to keep the main body healthy. And just like every boss, it has to be killed in multiple phases. It is one of the more annoying bosses despite being incapable of moving, especially during a swarm. Moving on to the last of the plants, we have the Stabravine. Not much is known about these creatures, whether they are truly plants or animal is up for debate, but the only thing we do know is that if you get anywhere close to these, they will attempt to pincushion your ass into the next dimension over. We have another twin situation here, one big and one small. The tall, skinny one shoots more like a sniper, and the small, fat one shoots more like a shotgun. At the end of the day though, unless you're digging a hole and they're able to lob a shot in, the Spitball Infector and Barrage Infector are a threat that will only hit you once or twice before you turn your back and turn around and turn them into dust. Up next, we have our favorite sentient rock, the Hearthstone. Not to be mistaken with a certain mobile game, mind you. We know next to nothing about these creature besides its abilities that are such telekinesis, energy manipulation, crazy lasers to kill you, and despite having no mouth, at least probably, through seismic activity, it can scream doing damage to every dwarf nearby. It is also quite possibly the most tanky thing in the game, so much so that we need a drill dozer just to break through its armor. But just like a lobster, once you break open its shell, you can get the nice shiny pearl inside. And bringing it back to base will be as smooth as petting a dolphin. Cancer. AIDS, even. Last of the stationary creatures, we have the cave leech. A creature that comes from a barnacle, usually on the ceiling. Through the power of God, this thing will stop you from using all your weapons when it grabs you. Once grabbed, if you have no backup, you will just get killed. It will slowly eat you and then drop your body to the floor. It is also said by some people that while dropping from the ceiling, they actually make a hissing sound. Although, no dwarf I have ever met has ever heard it. Not once. Whether they have been grabbed or not. It's a bird. It's a plane. No, it's a pair of nuts hitting you across the face. Up next, we have the flying section of enemies. First up, we have the Mac Terra spawn, boasting an antenna the size of a World War II bayonet and plenty of friends. They will spawn in massive numbers shooting out globs while being far in the background. There is also another variant of Mactera called the Trijaw, which will shoot out three acidic spines in bursts. There is also the Brundle, a heavily armored variant and the grabber that does its namesake. It has no ranged attack, but will grab dwarves carrying them around like little babies before dropping them from orbit. As an overweight cousin of the Mac Terrors, we also have the Goo Bomber. This thing shoots out balls of liquid that will slow down dwarves. And it is in fact fucking filled with the goo. Upon shooting it, you will most likely hit a goo sack towards the bottom of it. It will then fly around, spreading goo all across the map, ruining it until you fully kill it. Moving on to a different family, we have the Nadakai Breeder, a mothership to small jellyfish creatures. They flow around purely on a mission to spread more of itself. It will spawn dozens of jellyfish that will fly and dig towards dwarves while charging with static electricity in an attempt to electrocute any nearby enemies. Although, as a side note, if a breeder is killed, it is said that they taste delicious with a side of lemon. There is also a variant of the Nadokite jellyfish simply called the Cave Cruiser, which is completely docile. It seems to enjoy sucking up electricity and generally just floating around. 
another creature that doesn't mind dwarves, but it is still a threat nonetheless, is the Festerfleet. Despite having no real attacks, this is one of the few creatures that we actually know what it eats. If left unchecked, they will breed exponentially and eat any and all organic matter, robbing mission control from any flora or fauna that they would like to research. There is also the Hexawing Niffer, which does nothing special, but it will let you pet it if you get close enough. Following the trend of passive creatures, we also have the Cave Angel, a formerly domesticated creature, at least we think it is, swims through the air and is weirdly okay with being grabbed and used as a hang glider for however long you decide to use it. Second to last of the harmless and ultimately useless creatures is the Joe Biden of Glyphids, a cave vine. Possibly an offshoot of the cave leech will sit motionless until a dwarf approaches it. Upon getting close, it will make weird noises and start using its tentacles to poke and prod you and any nearby dwarfs. It is unknown why it does this, but it will still make you uncomfortable regardless. And lastly, there is the Silicate Harvester, a creature that is neither aggressive nor scared of you. It seems to hum a tune while looking for microscopic crystals to eat. Overall, they are a welcomed respite to the dangers of the rest of the planet. Now, before we move on to the honorable mentions and other more inorganic things, we have the miscellaneous section. These did not really fit in any category, so here we are. Firstly, we got the loop bug, a creature that somehow evolved to eat precious minerals and resources while also having no ability to defend itself whatsoever. This makes most dwarves rather sad when killing them, but of course nothing will stop the miners of DRG from achieving their quotas. In a similar vein, we also have the Hermit Crab, aka the Hooli Hoarder. This is a more advanced case of, sorry buddy, you're growing precious resources out of your back, we have to kill you. However, this guy is actually fast enough to possibly outrun you, and it will try its damnedest to do so and dig deep into the planet, never to be seen again. Up next on this list, we have conceivably another life stage of the Glyphids, the Maggot, which apparently for a good portion of its life is spent living on the surface to soak up solar radiation for unknown but probably nefarious reasons. Another thing that appears harmless are things such as the Brock Barnacle that will spread as much as possible gaining nutrients from rocks. Though this makes uh, everything a bit more dangerous as the bra barnacles will eat the nutrients of the rocks, damaging the cave structure. Last on the list is the carnivorous larva that only has one attack called suicide jump. These larvae love to burrow into anything they can get their grubby little jaws on, be it flesh or rock. So keep in mind that they are thankfully a rare encounter. Okay, before we move on to DRG's rival company, Robots, we will cover the Rockpox incident. This incident involved the Rockpox, of course, which would kill bugs and infest their bodies. This made their skin as hard as stone, greatly boosting their durability and not affecting their cognitive functions too badly. The only way to quickly kill any infected creature was by shooting the rock pox bulbs that would build up on an infected creature. Now that we've covered that, we shall go over the rival robots. Firstly, we start with the Shredder, a tiny robot that its main purpose is slamming its jagged edges into any dwarf it could find. Usually going down rather fast, but not before getting a hit off or two. Usually close by to some shredders would always be a patrol bot or two. These are decently tanky and decently damaging flying robots, though they have su supreme security issues as they can easily be hacked. The robot faction also has three types of turrets, sniper, burst fire, and shield generator. These are usually scattered around caves in clustered groups, making traversal much harder. Now, when it comes to the heavy hitters, we have the Prospector Drone that does its best to scan Hoxies and calculate its resource potential. 
it has stupid amounts of armor and no real way of defending itself besides screaming for its friends, making it quite a slog to take down. Next we have the aptly named Rival Nemesis, a nearly unstoppable robot that was built purely for killing dwarves. Specifically, it can even copy dwarves' voices to lure them in, and then crush them to death with robot appendages. It is nearly impossible to rip yourself free from its grasp unless the nemesis just gets clumsy and collides with some of the surrounding terrain. Do note it can also generate its own force fields and will immediately self-destruct upon defeat. Lastly, for the robots, we have their main data center, also known as the caretaker. It is completely indestructible besides its heat tanks that will periodically open. It will summon all types of robots while it is being attacked and even spawn special appendages that will shoot at and attempt to bludgeon any nearby dwarves. If that wasn't enough, it can even electrocute standing on its platform. This makes it nearly invincible at both short and long ranges. And that is it for this video, except for an old relic and a parasite on Hoxies that seem to be nearly extinct. We have the Betsy and the Zynarch Charge Suckers. An old world relic, the Betsy, was supposed to help clear Hoxies of all known threats, but they all ended up getting taken over by the aforementioned Zynarchs. Somehow, these creatures were able to override Betsy's protocols while munching on exposed wiring, specifically making it so that Betsy goes after dwarves. Now, if it weren't for these creatures, the Betsy's would be having minimal problems taking down most creatures. Despite being in massive disrepair, the Betsy is still a force to be reckoned with, boasting precision shots, showering the area in bombs, precision bombs, and even a shield generator. If you are able to inflict enough damage on the Zynarchs, then you can repair the Betsy and bring it back to your side until it is likely to be infected again later. And that's it. Next video will be the final part of the DRG series. Next, we'll be covering some of the lore, the regions of the planet itself, and special events that have taken a place within Hoxie's system.